for me, it's actually ended up being surrounding myself with other people with the same issue. <laughs> That's where you find belonging or connection. It's like, ah, you guys struggle with it as well. Oh, uh, you're a blend of like four different things too. <laughs> awesome. Nice. You get We're the struggles. Get yeah. yeah. Here's something that I've struggled with for a long time. I've never felt fully connected to the place where I'm from. The truth is, I never felt culturally American. I never felt fully at home in the United States. And, you know, I never even really liked using the word American. That feels a little bit exclusive considering all of the Americas. Argentinians have a little bit of a gripe with this. Now, I feel very lucky to have been born there and to have grown up there. All the opportunities that came with that. So I'm, I'm highly cognizant of that, but it's actually besides the point because I'm talking about cultural identity. My search for a place where I belong has led me to move abroad. I've lived in several different countries, uh, but it's also led me to meet other people with this exact same problem. And that was the thinking behind this conversation and the first of this podcast, I might add. My guest today is my friend Bartholomew Joyce, who is a very talented singer and songwriter in the band Mandelbro. A link to his music, definitely worth checking it out. He'll explain this more in depth in the conversation, but he was born in the UK and then grew up in both the Netherlands and England. And now he lives in Paris. Now, as a side note, I felt that this was the perfect place for me to start because I have little experience with this format. I've never run a podcast before. So I felt I needed to test things out with friends, with people that I'm comfortable with first. What you are about to listen to is actually our second attempt to have a conversation. The first one failing miserably because we spent 20 minutes just trying to get on the same page on what the hell we were even talking about. Now, normally I cut out the fat because I don't want to bore people, but I thought it was really important to include this because I want to share the learning curve. I want to document the process of getting better at this. Before we dive into the conversation, I just wanted to briefly mention that this is not sponsored, but if you want to support my work, if you like what I'm doing, consider checking out Coeur Clothing. I'll leave a link to it in the description. There are a few items left from the initial drop that went with the launch of the brand, and once they're sold out, they're gone. I'm not making more. Thank you so much, and now, I hope you enjoy. All right, attempt number two. Honestly, and I appreciate you for the patience. <laughs> the, the, I've had my experience trying to do a podcast <laughs> and it went horribly for the first 12 episodes. After the first 12, you felt it got better? We stopped after the first 12. <laughs> <laughs> oh That's what we were like, this is never getting better. Oh Let's move God. on with our lives, get some life experience so we actually have something to talk about. Yeah. So, you know, four years later, uh, maybe I'll be a somewhat decent guest now. That's an interesting topic in and of itself, right? I mean, I've had that thought where it's like, mm, am I too young to write a book? Maybe I need to live life more before yeah. I make things, you know? Um, I have this feeling of there's, there's an extent to which life always feels very dense with lots of information and lots of interesting things to talk about in your day to day. But if I would sit down and talk about my life... I don't think I have sufficient life experience or wisdom to share with anyone. And so I don't, <laughs> or I don't talk about these things Yeah, and thinking like, well, maybe one day there will be enough things to talk about that it becomes interesting. But what am I to say anything interesting at this age? I don't know whenever, when that will actually happen. I hear you. But on the flip side, it's been so cool to share my thoughts as I go through life. And then I can look back on how things have changed. That's pretty yeah. sick, you know? Yeah. So I don't regret it, even though I do feel like I look like a dumbass sometimes on the internet for all to see. Yeah, I, I, I think it's also good to push back against this desire to appear as wise and like all well put together all the time mm. and just knowledgeable because we aren't. And to see someone kind of earnestly stumble through things publicly, I find way more interesting and I can actually connect with that much more than someone who's like really articulate all the time and always very interesting and i don't know i've i definitely try and make videos and share things as well knowing that i don't have everything figured out and that's kind of part of the subject matter it's like i don't know things yet but i'm excited about it and know that there's enough people that would also want to see this and also don't know things that would be aided by a protagonist who is also figuring it out. So you don't need to come with all the answers right away. Right. But for a podcast, I thought that might have been too early when, when I was like in my 20s at university doing a podcast. Didn't have much to talk about. Mm. And that's very different from making videos where it's like, I'm going to figure something out and show my experience. I mean, my pushback on this is that 
what you could have done is just talk about what it is like to be a 20 year old in university. I mean, that's a once in a lifetime thing. Right. And then it's gone. Yeah. Um, and that's interesting probably for other, I mean, I don't know for other students in university at that age. Um, I, I think that's the beautiful thing about conversation, right? It's like, we're kind of working our way through ideas and what we get to bounce it off of each other and test things out, you know? Um, but so. there's there's still a gap between, yeah, there is something interesting about what the life of a student is or what, there's something interesting about that, but it doesn't mean that through speaking, you'd be able to actually express the interesting parts or to be able to make the right observations of like, okay, that is actually quite unique about my life and to be able to talk about that and express it. That's different from just having that unique aspect to your life. And I think to know how to articulate what is unique about what you're experiencing right now is, is a, maybe a skill or something that you just have. And I didn't particularly see any of that interesting stuff coming through in the attempts I'd made to record conversations mm. in the past. And I think over time, as you grow and you observe more things, you get better at pointing towards the, the, the important different things that you want to express. And in the past, I couldn't really do that. And all you say ends up being quite shallow because as much as you know, there's something deeper underneath it, you can't get to it or you can't put that into words. But you felt it even back then you felt that there was greater depth you weren't getting at. Yeah. So that's, that's, and it was happening that's in all the conversations that we didn't record. Right. Or it's, it's, right. it's, as soon as we felt a little bit judged by, oh, this is being recorded now and we have to sound maybe smart or like articulate, it became less articulate and perhaps we were focused too much on that that we forgot to actually um, get excited and interested by the conversation themselves mm. and just get into it in the same way that a free-flowing conversation would. So, right. I don't know. Do you feel that you've graduated out of that? Like, do you feel... no. No. You're on a podcast right now, bro. Yeah, well, yeah, true, Great. true. Um, Great. Yeah, I don't know. Well, I, I think, I think I've, I've relied heavily on seeking out other crafts, like going more deeply into music and film to an extent, because I've always felt, always felt a little inadequate in terms of how articulate I am. I don't find language to be the easiest for me to get my thoughts out, or I find that my mm. thoughts are going faster than the words uh, that I can speak and that I can't really quite find the words. And throughout my life, I've always had an issue being good in languages. And so I've decided to run, to jump into other things where I can perhaps express myself better or as with music, because it's abstract enough, not being understood is not really a big deal. <laughs> it's like, if you can't quite express clearly your ideas, um, that's not the, the aim of music necessarily. It's to express a certain feeling. Um, and I feel much more comfortable with that because then if you can't quite get your ideas across, you're, you're still doing something uh, that has an impact on people. So perhaps I, 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 I'm not still to this day, not quite good with speaking words <laughs> <laughs> oh dude, god this is I, horrible no i i um, don't dude i i don't think any of that was horrible honestly i think you're actually articulating something so many people struggle with and i think that it takes a lifetime to figure out where you stand on things and how to put incredibly intangible like emotions into words or right. lived experiences so i think some people i mean i'm very attracted to that so I find myself putting a lot of effort and energy into getting better at it, but it, it doesn't, I don't think it ever gets easy. I mm. think that even when it comes to writing my experiences, it's like the first stuff you write is often garbage. It's just vomiting on the page. And then you have to sort of keep putting stuff down and like sift through it to pull out the nuggets, if that makes sense. Yeah. So what I like about conversation though, is that it's very human. It's, 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 our attempts to string together words that mean something as we stumble along. Yeah. So anyway, but easy, I guess maybe easier for me to say that to you. I think I also sound like a fucking dumbass, you know, yeah. when I say things and there's this very judgmental voice in my head. 
um, that I don't want to let stop me from doing this, if that makes sense. I mean, the, the, the thinking behind doing this is to get better at it. So hopefully I don't have the same experience where after 12 episodes I'm done. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, I think the, the main thing is you just have to keep going. And uh, having listened to a lot of conversations doesn't necessarily prepare you for being able to, to record really good conversations. Mm. And it takes practice like anything else. And even I, when I first came to France and I started learning French, um, I listened much more than I spoke. And I spent, I think, the first two years not really speaking much French beyond simple phrases. Right. Um, and eventually, I felt a little bit comfortable to start speaking French. And I then started speaking French. And then you just have to confront the fact that it's not very good yet and you don't sound quite good and you're making a fool of yourself and some people will judge you and others won't and you keep speaking and the the good ending to that is eventually you become sufficiently good at French that it's it's good and and you can speak your mind and you can express yourself and the reality is that I'm still not there and for mm. a long time you're just you just have to get used to the fact that you sound a little dumb and your friends and many people are willing enough to to try and understand what you're trying to say, regardless of if it sounds dumb or right. if there's like if it's bereft with grammatical errors and all sorts of stuff like that. Um, and there are some people that will judge you because the way you're delivering the information is done in kind of a bad or messy way, and that's just life. Like you just have to accept that for a long time or. I don't know. At least for me, I think it will take a long time. Yeah. But for anyone to, to get to a point where you can really articulate things takes a long time. Um, but it's just part of it. You have to accept. It's like, okay, you're not going to sound great all the time. Or you're not going to sound like this intelligent, perfect person because you're actually not <laughs> a perfectly intelligent, yeah. perfectly articulate person <laughs> ever. Or it's it's a it's a craft. It's a craft like anything else. And yeah. if you want to get really articulate, you have to actually speak a lot. And I don't think I necessarily do that all the time. Or especially in Paris, being around a lot of people that are international or French, there isn't much of an emphasis put on being very articulate, even in English. Like I don't speak a very high level of English with a lot of people around me because you're usually speaking with people who's... English is their second language. Right. And so... It's, you can get lazy with it. You get lazy, but also it, it's, it doesn't add much value in a conversation if you're going to start using more special words mm -hmm. if the other people are not going to be able to follow it. So the English I've learned to speak over the past four years is the English of can I get ideas through knowing that the recipients have a more basic level of English right. in a way where we can really understand each other. You know what this makes me think of? My mom told me that being a mother of young children drastically reduces your vocabulary because you're saying the same like right. 20 words all the time, you know, yeah. and it and it has an effect on the mind. Um, it, it, you, it, it almost feels like your vocabulary is your tool set for exploring ideas, if that makes sense. Um, I don't know if you felt more limited in being able to have more advanced conversations or... Well, yeah. You, yeah. Oh, okay. Definitely. Yeah. Um, well, it's something that I basically said, uh, kind of accepted to give up coming to, to France, coming to a different country. Is I'm going to learn a new culture and learn it, try and learn a new language. And in doing so, I am going to lose some of the sophistication I had with English and the level of conversations I had right. coming from like a good English university where everybody's just talking intelligently all the time. Maybe not everybody. And there's it's not exactly that. But I had very challenging and interesting philosophical conversations quite frequently with my friends and that's kind of the thing we really liked to do and coming to France it was more about okay what things can I do action wise and articulating or exploring interesting things in a conversation took took the back seat that wasn't mm -hmm. a priority and I kind of accepted for a long time that you're not going to have deep and challenging conversations about things right um and I was willing to make that compromise because I thought that there was a lot of interesting stuff that I could do here. So let's just do that. And let's use English and French and these languages just to, to, to connect with people. And 
in a way, I liked that. In a way, I, I've actually enjoyed having, um, uh, not being able to rely too much on depth in conversation or in my life for a while and having to focus on much simpler things. It's kind of a humbling thing for two years. I didn't understand any politics. I right. didn't understand French politics. And nobody here was really talking about English politics. And so I just didn't talk about politics at all. And that's kind of really liberating in a way because the things people told me about French politics, I could just hear that it sounds exactly like the same conflicts of like good versus bad that I've heard in English stuff all the time. And then I realized that they're all kind of the same story and to not really be able to dig in and have these big debates about it really uh, removed or like freed me up to think about other things. So, so hold on. So yeah. on that point, that's really interesting. Let's back up a little bit. Um, you are a third culture kid. Yeah. Um, as am I, um, which is, I guess the definition would be you grew up in a place that's, uh, that has a different culture, oftentimes a different language from, uh, your family. Yeah. Um, and then this can be compounded by living in a foreign country as a kid or as an adult. Um, do you mind giving like the really brief background of this so people can understand the cultures that you lived in and were a part right. of? And then, and then we can have a more interesting conversation about belonging somewhere and what that right. ends up looking like when it becomes this weird mess of different things. Yeah. Okay. So I, I was born in, in England, in the countryside in Gloucestershire. I spent five years growing up in England and then I moved um, to the Netherlands and I lived in a city called Nijmegen and I lived there for 10 years and I went to school in the Netherlands and had a Dutch education. And then at 16 with my family, we went back to the UK and I finished my school first in London. And then I went to university in, uh, in Coventry in like the Midlands of England. Okay. And, and so I've had this mix of spending basically the first half of my life between England and the Netherlands. Almost equivalently, but at diff different stages of development. Yes, exactly. So I had just the earliest stage in, in England and then... Did you speak English when you left England? I guess you were five years old, so you, you had English. Yeah. When I first moved to the Netherlands, I didn't speak Dutch. Okay. And so I was, I was behind. I wasn't able to communicate really with the other toddlers when I went to like the first year of school. Right. So there's, there's that influences your development in very... <laughs> like it, It's probably influenced how I grew up in quite a substantial way, mm. but... Just to finish the story, I did that until I was 20. I, I, at 21, I finished studying in the UK and then I came to France to live in Paris and I've been there for four years now. So it's now I'm 25. So yeah, half of the time in the Netherlands, half the time in England and more recently or in my adult life um, in France. And how... I We've talked a lot about this privately, but... How has that affected your sense of identity? When people ask you like, okay, mm. what are you? You know, where are you from? How do you answer that question? Yeah, I don't know. Uh, I would say I'm probably closer. I feel closer to being English than, than Dutch. Um, Even though you spend an equivalent amount of time pretty much in both places. Yeah. Yeah. Why do you think that is? Um, I connected less with the Dutch culture. I didn't, I didn't find it as, I didn't belong there necessarily. I felt like a, like an outlier or a weirdo. Um, and in England, I felt much more welcomed culturally and just in terms of what, what my interests were and what other people were interested in, in England, it was much more, uh, uh, I just enjoyed it so much more and felt so much more at home. But more specifically London or anywhere in England, because London um, is very different from, you know, a, a smaller town. I can definitely, well, I can definitely see the differences between uh, London and uh, Coventry, where I was living, or Leamington Spa, where London is definitely more crazy and artistic and open to a lot more ideas. But even still, in the more in the smaller cities and villages in the UK, where I spent some time, um, there's something that I liked more um, in some weird, uh, perhaps instinctive, instinctive or subconscious way about 
British people mm. where I connected more with them. And also meeting uh, like Scottish people, I find them to be really nice as well. Like there's some <laughs> there's something about British people in general, I think that I can <clears throat> understand or that I connect with. So yeah. I would say off based off that, that I'm more English than I am Dutch. But even so, I know that I'm not fully English or there's still a, quite a rift. Um, right. First, I don't really have the accent. So there's a lot of things that just single me out as not being English. Isn't that weird? Isn't it weird that like um, how important that is? People, you saying I'm, I'm British, right? People would probably, that's always a sticking point. They're like, yeah. wait, what? From where? <laughs> yeah. yeah. And they, they probably don't know. Does that make you feel uh, it, like singled out or different? No. Um, I don't know. I, I've never, I think I never had the opportunity to, f to really feel at home anywhere. Right. Because everywhere I had that double identity of like, yeah. okay, I'm living here, but I'm also Dutch or living here, but I'm also English. Yeah. Um, so I never, I always knew that I was a little bit out of the norm, but that never seemed to be a problem. Like I didn't, I learned maybe much later that there's this idea of feeling at home and belonging somewhere that I didn't tie to being in a certain place or in a certain culture. And if I hadn't had that experience growing up, I think I would be much more hesitant to make a move and go to France than I, f than I ended up doing. I, f I found that quite exciting and looked forward to that as, a, as a, an experience and wasn't so worried upon arriving in France that I wouldn't be able to understand or get along with people there. I was just like, oh, let me just discover this. Like, yeah. This is be fun. And well, this is this, by the yeah. way, is a trait of third culture kids. Um, and I've I have one British friend that spent some time in France that I got to know here, who felt just so much more British all the time, and immediately had some kind of like, okay, I'm not French, right? It's like there's this gap between us, and I like my British things, and I want to go back, and <laughs> like there was there was a difficulty um, for him to adapt and accept another culture, and I don't. I don't think everybody is like that. I think that there's some people that may have been British all their lives that then would be happy to jump into and become part of a different culture. But generally, there's more of a hesitance. Right. And I think I didn't have that because of never having the belonging in a culture. Yeah. I mean, it, it's for me, this is just such a fascinating topic because on one level, it's, it's a little bit down to the individual, right? Like... Mm. I, somebody else that lived your life might have identified much more strongly with Dutch culture and not British culture, right? Um, you know, in the case of even the difference between my brother and I um, and your sisters also were kind of along for the ride across these different countries. You know, my brother and I have, a, I think, we agree actually on a lot of things, but I don't think we have necessarily this exact same relationship with the United States, uh, where we right. were both born, uh, Argentina, where our parents are from, right? Um, and uh, certainly now with uh, the countries that we live in, France and Portugal, right? Um, it's it's interesting to me, you know, like how certain things can be important for certain people, yeah. right? And for me, I, it, I don't know if you ever went through this, there was this deep sense of longing for like uh, the the home, you know, right? I I felt a lot of frustrations with the United States growing up, um, and it it's funny because now not living in the U.S. anymore and and having lived my expat life now for several years, I can actually more easily appreciate all of the wonderful things that the United States provided me. Right, I, I feel very privileged, um, but being there and being kind of what felt like stuck in that bubble, especially in suburbia, I, I, I just wanted to escape basically. And, yeah. um, and so I created these kind of like f ideas, these fantasies about Argentina, where my parents came from, um, that that would kind of, in a way it's, it sounds silly to say it out loud, but I, I kind of thought it would solve all of the problems I had with the United States, right? Because over there, they eat amazing food and they speak a romance language, which is more beautiful. And when you know, did, when did you make that? When did you have that idea? It grew all throughout um, my like childhood and adolescent life. Um, 
And did at some point you you went over to yeah I did you so went to see and you wanted to live out this this kind of dream or ideal that you had? yeah so here's the what interesting happened? thing I, I didn't speak I, Spanish is my first language actually okay. um, and then I lost it at the age of four or five years old because both my parents are bilingual and um, you know they integrated extremely well into. Uh, the United States, and they worked in English. I went to school in English, and they didn't want to confuse me too much, so I just became the language to speak. And I got very frustrated about that because I cared about this. My brother didn't seem right. to care about this. I cared about this a lot, you know. He was super happy just just speaking all English, or I think I think he, yeah. I mean, he expressed a desire to learn Spanish, but he doesn't currently speak it, and yeah. he doesn't. It wasn't like a life-ending thing for well, so him. So how, how much of an age gap is there? between Two and a half years. So he was younger, yeah. So by the time he was yeah. born, there was much less time that he yeah. was spoken Spanish to. Exactly. But there was this deep-seated frustration because I would see old footage of me as a kid, uh, like a baby, speaking Spanish and then not having that ability and not understanding what my family was saying and, and whatnot. And mm -hmm. so, um, and, and then on top of it, there was just enough non-American, non, you know, United States culture, I should say, um, in the house where we would eat these foods from Argentina and I would hear the language, I would hear some of the music, tango and whatnot. And, you know, it, it made me feel distinctly not entirely American, quote unquote. I say American, yeah. Argentinians get bothered by this because it's part of the Americas as well, but I'm going to say that for simplicity. Yeah. And so this grew and grew and grew. I was frustrated as a teenager and I just, I didn't have the skills yet to learn languages. I didn't know how to do it. So eventually, after my exchange year in France, which happened when I was 16, 17 years old, um, I finally, like, I was like, okay, I know how to do this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to Argentina. I'm going to learn the language. And, and that's what I did when I was 18, about to turn 19. But so before then, you had an exchange year in France? Yeah. Okay. So that was your first experience jumping out of yeah. the U.S. and, and yeah. spending some time and I loved with it. a different language. It was amazing. Okay. But it was a bit artificial as well in the sense that, I mean, it was an incredible experience because of so many different things, right? Being exposed to different culture and the foods yeah. and the, and I loved the intellectual challenge of learning a new language, but it was artificial in the sense that I was living with host families. I was still very much a kid, like all of the actual things to worry about or struggle um, through were taken care of for me. So I had this... But it's even ironic that you felt um, you didn't quite feel at home in the U.S. because there as well you were just this kid with all your problems being taken care of. So yeah. what was this kind of negative image that you had or this longing to something else when you were in the U.S.? Where did that come from? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know. I think I, I wanted to go out and see the world, you know, and, and I guess for that year in France, it felt like, okay, for a while I'm not stuck. I got out of here. I'm in a new continent. I can visit all these other neighboring countries as well. You know, did you inherit that feeling from anyone? Was there, were there people no. around you that had that longing as well? That's the crazy or thing. It kind dude. of came of its own accord. That's the crazy thing. And that, that's, that's why it's interesting to me that you connected more with British culture. Um, my parents are not like super proud Argentinians. Like, right. <laughs> this is the frustrating thing. I wanted them to be super proud. I was like, yeah. where's the Argentinian pride? Especially because, here's the funny thing, the stereotype of Argentinians is to be super proud, you know? they have We have Messi, we have the Pope, you know, we have Tango, we have Asados. Like, it's just, the, it's the right. same things over and over again. Um, and, you know, <laughs> a lot of neighboring countries dislike Argentinians for this reason. Right. And I just and your parents were the tamest Argentinians. They're, like, they're they're exactly the same as you and I in the sense that I mean they left actually as yeah. they were in I mean my mom when she was eighteen my dad when he was eleven so they they were never like a hundred percent anything either. Um, <clears throat> and the funny thing is when I arrived in Argentina it it was like getting so slapped in the face. I mean absolutely nobody treated me like an Argentinian because I wasn't. I just arrived <laughs> and I had no cultural yeah. references. Right. I had my accent. I spoke, I try to speak with the Argentinian accent, which is distinctive, but I get there. I'm trying so hard. I'm like bright eyed, bushy tailed, you know, and everybody's like, you know, they would call me a shanky. Shanky is a, it's like a, it's a Spanish w word, at least used in Argentina for with the pronunciation uh, for Yankee, really, a Yankee 
being right. an American. It's like a nickname. Right. And um, that really, that was for me the, the beginning of being like, whoa, okay, I, I don't know if I will ever find a place that I fully belong. Right. You know, I'll, I'll have pieces of myself that were shaped by these different places. But the idea that I'll be able to just like, oh, that's home. Bingo. I'll, yeah. I'll stay right there. That, that's, that might not ever happen. I, I remember this, this thing my uncle once told me. I have an uncle who's, well, he's Dutch. And he and his wife, my aunt, moved to Belgium. And they spent, I think, 30 or so years there now. They've so, raised both of their children in, in Belgium. and Okay, so Netherlands to Belgium. To Belgium. So it's just a neighboring they're both country. Dutch, neighboring country. But there's, culturally, they're quite different. Or there's definitely a, a substantial difference. There's a reason why Belgium is like not, like doesn't want to be Dutch. Um, and they Of course, made I'm not great, suggesting otherwise. No, <laughs> but I mean, they, they've made a great effort to, to integrate well into Belgian culture and to be part of it as much as they can and to, to learn French and all of this stuff. Um, and he was noting that even after all of that time spent in Belgium, they're still referred to as the Dutch neighbors right by the by the people in their community and there's this shocking realization that that you can take from this is no matter your commitment to really integrate into a different culture that you're not originally from um having not fully grown up there you're never going to be belgian you're never going to i'm never going to be french um no matter if I stay here for 20 or 30 or 40 years and I learn the language perfectly and all of that stuff, culturally there will be something different. And I'm not going to a place and, uh, and setting myself up there for life with the intention to at some point be accepted completely as, as part of that country because I don't right. think that's going to happen. And that's kind of what hearing this from my uncle, what it reminded me of is you can learn as much as you want about a culture, but if you're really longing for, for a sense of belonging somewhere, it's not going to happen in the same way right. where a, a native from that area is going to refer to you as being native. It's like, you, don't, yeah. you can't do that. It's like, f for us, it's never going to happen. You could be American if you accepted it, but you don't. And you're never going to be Argentinian and you're never going to be French. Or really, never fully any of these things. Yeah. I mean, there's there's certainly parts of me that I think, especially, I mean, a lot of Europeans, this is the funny thing too, you're, you're treated as a different thing in different places. So Europeans see me and they're like, American, you know, by how I speak. Yeah. I think also, and I'm proud of this actually, the, the mentality of like, go for it, that like entrepreneurial <laughs> thing, right. you know, right. I love that. And I recognize now living here, oh, that's a, that's actually distinctly from the United States. Yeah. It exists in much smaller quantities elsewhere, but there's just like a, it's like a cultural thing over there, you know? Yeah. <clears throat> um, but it doesn't, I think the, the frustrating thing is that there's this gap always between what you're feeling and how people are treating you. Um, and, and, but I think at a certain point, at least for me, and it seems like for you too, you give up, right? You stop <laughs> trying. Yeah. You, who are you trying to convince any? anybody of or anything of yeah. I should say right like who are you uh why does it matter if you fit perfectly in this box or that box I think there's a safety or a comfort that comes from that but at the end of the day I am what I am and it's it's actually kind of cool this blend of different things I've seen it I've come to see it as a strength in many ways so yeah the, the only challenge that I, I find comes with that is this does this continued desire to belong somewhere. And I've, I've kind of realized that you have to create that, you know, and it might end up being, for me, it's actually ended up being surrounding myself with other people with the same issue. <laughs> right. That's you know? where you find belonging or connection. It's like, ah, you guys struggle with it as well. Oh, uh, you're a blend of like four different things too. <laughs> awesome. Nice. You get We're the struggles. Get yeah. yeah. Well, I think this is, this is difficult because I think one thing that happens coming from multiple cultures is it does turn you into someone who's got a more individualistic perspective on life because you don't have one group that you can really associate yourself with uh, correctly so maybe some of the things i'm going to say are just going to be individualistic and it's not the only way to think mm. about it but my take on this is that by not having one culture that you fully belong to you're confronted 
at a much earlier point in life by the fact that you have to construct your identity yourself. You have to pick out and decide for yourself what you want to do, where you want to be, who you want to spend your time with, and what you want to spend your time doing mm. in a way that you might not be confronted by um, as strongly if you had a culture that you fully belong to. It's like, I've been forced to, to really think about the content of my life because there wasn't much of a pre-written thing to go off of. And I see that as, as a, a great benefit because I think everybody at some point is going to have to confront those things and have to decide for themselves how they want to lead their lives and where they want to do that and who they want to do it with. But it can be delayed if you have this comfort of having specific answers or, or a certain trajectory or a comfortable place where you already feel at home. But that I, I do admit that is perhaps an individualistic perspective. Maybe it's much better to have a place where you already feel at home and have a path that's, that's laid out more um, cleanly or is, is that where, where you can more easily visualize where you could be for your life because you're, you see a lot of people that are similar in where they came from right. and how they grew up. Um, but I don't know, obviously I'm going to have to, I have an individualistic view on this because yeah. that's just how I've grown up. But I think it's good actually to have to confront your, the construction of your own identity yourself. And that's come from the fact that I couldn't take it from just one country. I hadn't thought about that. Um, but you know, it, it makes a lot of sense to me. I mean, it, it's certainly a lot simpler to have like, uh, your whole identity or sense of attachment to a place be one single place versus multiple different things because it can create confusion. I mean, it, it created confusion for me uh, growing up and I tried, I overcompensated. I mean, I've always admired, I guess, to a, to a, in a sense, people that have felt uh, pride or, um, yeah, like a strong, uh, I don't know, connection or debt almost to their country it's kind of a it's a it's not kind of it's a very foreign concept to me right. uh because it, i just have not felt that singular thing for any single place I, I i've done it enough times now where you see pros and cons to basically anywhere you go yeah so the idea of just being like yeah that's my team is yeah. like t it's it's a little too I don't, it, it doesn't make sense to me, but I have always, I tried, I certainly tried to do this. And then I also, in a sense, I, I admire that that exists, right? You, you, the world cup is happening right now and, and people are cheering for the teams that represent their countries. And it's kind of cool to see the, the level of emotion. Yeah. This is channeled, I guess, in a positive sense versus like a, a much more negative sense, which is like, Oh, my country is going to invade your country or whatever. Right. Yeah. Um, but, and I, if I'm not mistaken, uh, the Greeks had four different, um, words for love. Um, and, uh, one of them is a love for something bigger, like a, 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 a nation or something like that. And right. I, um, I don't know. I just haven't been able to boil it down to, to one single thing. And yeah. right now I can say it nonchalantly, but for a long time I was like, what's wrong with me? You know, like right. why, why can't I find this sense of connection? And then on top of it, people that on the flip side have maybe like only lived in one place or like have maybe never even left their country, which is a privilege in and of itself. I think, uh, they, what we're saying probably sounds nonsensical, right? Like how, how can you not have that sense of connection? Um, well, or what I was going to say is quite the opposite is from our perspective, some of our existential problems of who we are come from or originate from the fact that we're not tied to one culture. And so we're assuming that other people that may have just grown up in one culture would have a simpler life because for us, <laughs> a lot of our problems stem from, um, from not having that part figured out. But the reality might be that you grow up in one culture with, with the, the comfort of that and you will have the same kind of conflict or problem on some other, uh, in some other aspect of your life or right. you'll be more preoccupied with the thing. It's not like, oh, I'm just growing up in one culture, everything's fine. Um, this idea of not feeling like you belong comes up no matter where you're from because mm. you can grow up 
um, in the in one place from a family where the mom and the dad are are from that culture and it's all perfectly fine and you still have this this yearning to to run away and escape or or be something else like it doesn't you i think there's a lot of people that might experience the same thing that you experienced or the same thing that i experienced that don't have the the same um actual uh story behind it or or actually personal trajectory or whatever right yeah the 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 feeling that we're getting out of of not quite belonging it's something that you kind of crafted for yourself because if you wanted you could have probably belonged in the u.s as a as an american and maybe i could have belonged more as a as a dutch person do you think this is down to choice because i don't feel i picked this I, i wasn't trying to be like quirky or different or whatever you know what yeah. i mean i i just this started at a at such an early age i think that i wasn't even fully aware of it and it has informed many of the life decisions like oh, okay i'm gonna i'm gonna leave this i'm gonna move to another yeah. place you know um that has never felt like a choice i mean the choice is the decision of stay or leave right but the choice of do I feel I belong here? Right. It, it's never felt like a choice. Yeah. Um, you didn't choose that conflict. And in, in a sense, like I said, my relationship with the United States, for example, culturally, not politically, I'm not going to talk about the politics, um, has improved. Like I said, I can, uh, I can appreciate certain things that I hmm. picked up or grew up in better now because I'm not there. So the distance actually helped. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of people see that as a, as a, uh, well, I was going to say, say, see that as a betrayal. I don't, I think moving abroad is not seen as a betrayal, but being like, I don't think I'm maybe coming back. I think a lot of people, when I did my video about that, who I can't say never, but I don't really have any intentions of going back. And a lot of people mm. took that very personally. And I, I don't mean it disrespectfully. It's just, I don't feel that's the place for me, at least right now, but yeah. certainly for the foreseeable future. I mean, and that's okay. You know, <laughs> but to go back to this thing of the that the conflict you didn't pick the conflict or you this feeling of this yearning for belonging um, was just a thing that you had and it, it kind of sprouted out of nowhere. I find that really interesting because I to me as well I think it's it's come from out of nowhere or it's maybe per, part of my personality that I. Uh, didn't feel like I belonged in any particular place, but also in many other parts of my life, I'm very anti, um, anti structure or anti establishment. It's like, I'm very much trying to figure out my own way through a lot of things. Mm -hmm. And it's part of how I break things down. It's like, okay, what I know what seems to work for that person, but what will work for me? And I'm never taking it for granted that there's some formula or pattern that I could just follow and be happy with because someone else has done it. Right. And that core way or that core perspective that I have on life and how I decide things maybe stems from where I came from, or maybe I always had that. And then it's like, what is the root of that trait or that perspective? I don't know. I, I think people who have grown up in a very normal situation as, as children could have that same perspective. So this is this is this is where I'm getting a little confused or I'm I'm wondering a little bit of were we were we shaped by our circumstances as kids of having come from different cultures to then think a certain way or did it come it was were like we born DNA, with that conflict yeah, 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 yeah. and it mapped on quite well or we could justify it rationally because oh <clears> we're <throat> we're from different cultures and this and that but Perhaps that's there's more of a, a a deeper drive there that is just kind of part of our nature. So I don't know. I find I don't know. I yeah. find that interesting. Maybe I could have just been super happy and content being Dutch or super happy and content being British. Um, but for some reason that wasn't really what I was after. And then I decided to continue going and go to France. And even here, my intention is not to really become fully part of the culture because yeah. I don't see that as as a result that I would perhaps be satisfied with because I'm too yeah. much in my head of, I want to, I want to decide for myself what, what would be a nice life to live. And so far I've got all the people around me here that make this feel really 
homely and I mm-hmm. feel like I belong here, but not because of um, the, the, the culture at large, but just because of the, the people I have around me that just, that's the belonging that, that I've been looking for. Totally. And if you didn't have that, maybe you would have continued your search and gone on to the next place. Yeah. So it makes you think maybe we developed this sense of rejection because there was something lacking there from the beginning. But had it been a better fit, maybe I would have never developed the curiosities about other cultures and I would have just been like, you know what? This works for me. I'll stay here. It was interesting to see you. We, we did a little bike trip over the summer in the Netherlands and it was, it was mm-hmm. very interesting to see you back in the country f- for the first time in, in some time. Yeah, probably since lockdowns, so since two years. And to see just how emotional the reactions were. Right. There was a certainly, I don't know if there was, uh, you could say nostalgia, but there was some, some degree of rejection also taking place where you were seeing places where you grew up or places that resembled where you grew up. Mm. And you were like, ooh, I'm glad I don't live here anymore. Yeah, it's, it's really unusual and I'm still not sure uh, whether I like the Netherlands or whether I don't. Um, and I think as I'm growing older, I'm, I'm finding aspects of the Netherlands culturally that I do really like and that I can see a bit in myself and in mm-hmm. who I am that makes me more proud of being Dutch, but also not, but still never quite feeling Dutch. So I don't know. Uh, I'm, I'm very conflicted with that that country but i i do really appreciate it i think it's really cool but i can't i don't find the the belonging or whatever the sense of of this is my place i just think it's interesting just to i don't know tie everything together in a sense because it just it struck me as you were saying that i think i'd like to live in a world where it's okay to express these opinions freely Mm. and 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 that's not so abnormal i think a lot of people People are always going to have the reactions to the things you say, but it, it's, you're not, I, I don't see you disrespecting Dutch culture at all. It's more so, it's just, this clicks, this doesn't click. Right. Yeah. And it's funny how, how much that can trigger reactions in other people, right? Like you traitor, you know, or whatever. <laughs> right. Yeah. But obviously I don't feel that way because I don't feel the attachment towards the Netherlands. Right. Yeah. But, but people felt that way when I talk about the United States right. and, and, um, or Argentina, which has its own problems, right? There's a, there's, there. Are, I've made my own personal decisions yeah. regarding living there, not living there, right? Um, but I think that it, it should, it should be okay to be able to make your own decision on whether something clicks or doesn't click. It's good. I, I, I see it as a net positive to be like, no, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go on a search for other cultures other places that might click a little bit more or i'll t- i'll pick things up from these different places that i go and maybe i'll make my own little recipe for what works you know i had from from a very early quite early on i met people from different cultures that i really connected with and that kind of opened me up to this idea that it's not the culture that makes you connect with people i don't know I, after i finished studying i after i graduated i went on this one week uh, vacation to 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 the U.S. I went to visit New York. First right. time leaving Europe, I was like, "Whoa, this is crazy!" And I went to New York, and I was like, "This is crazy. I've seen all this before, but it's like weird and loud." And <laughs> it was like very, it was a lot for sensory stuff. And yeah. it was jet lag, so I was just at like five in the morning, just walking through the street, and everyone like the cleaners <laughs> are going past. Were you like, there alone? Super intense, completely alone. Wow, um, I loved it, and I met a few people there. Uh, that one is I met this this guy called Philip and his wife Susan. <laughs> Susan's Taiwanese American, uh, or Taiwanese and lived in the U.S. And Philip is American. Um, I forgot exactly where in the U.S. he's from, but he's not from New York originally. Right. And over the course of one night, I felt like we've always been friends. Oh wow! Or something like there was there was there was such a trust immediately off the bat of of connecting with them and. Interestingly, the fact that Susan is Taiwanese and American and having multiple cultures could be could be a reason for that. Um, but early on, I, I noticed I met people like that where I was like, OK, you, we've grown up in completely different parts of the world our entire lives. And we come and we talk about stuff and I feel like we've been friends forever. That's really unusual. There are people that live across the street from me in the Netherlands 
that I don't feel I have a connection with. Right. So there's something strange going on there. Um, but there is always the question in your mind of like, well, there's clearly something you have in common with the people you live right next door from. There's, there's certainly something I have in common with Dutch people that I don't have in common with people that are not from the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. But either I haven't really found what that is yet, or I don't value that as much as I value the, the, maybe the personalities that I connect with. Totally. So I don't entirely know what it is. You know, you know what this makes you think of? This is hilarious. I kind of never realized this, but, uh, I've never had so many American friends in my life. Now that I don't live in the U.S. <laughs> so, right. And I think, I think this is because, um, well, first of all, I think uh, Americans that come to, to Paris or to it's live a, it's abroad. It's a specific kind of American. That it's a different breed, I think. to live here. Yeah, exactly. You, you have to go through so many formative experiences, so much bureaucratic BS, uh, the visa struggles, the bank account struggles, the where am I going to live, right? The language barriers, all that stuff. So there's there's already a lot, actually, of bonding material there. But it, it has also just made me realize that, um, like you said, it, I don't know, it, it seems to be a confluence of factors. It seems like uh, environment matters a lot. Removing myself and placing myself in a different place changed things a lot. But it's not fair for me to put everyone from a particular country in a in a particular bucket because... You know, like you said, there's some people you're going to naturally connect with and that just might be an energetic thing or it's because of their sensibilities. They're into the arts or they're into the sciences or whatever it might be. Um, and some people you don't connect with, right? Um, but it's it's interesting because I think a few years ago, I would have said something a lot more just blanket statement like, yeah, I just don't, I don't know. I just don't connect with Americans, you know? Right. <laughs> but that's actually not... That's not true. I just hadn't figured out that I needed to remove myself from my like suburban, you know, quiet yeah. town that I grew up in and that there's actually so much more out there. So, but also think of how many Americans have that same desire to remove themselves from the suburban yeah. context that they grew up in. It's probably like a pretty big percentage of Americans that right. grew up in suburbs, it's like 10% or something. Will be Who like, knows? I want to get out of here yeah. and go to a city, or like maybe most of them will not go so far as to completely leave that culture and try and go to a different country. Right. But there's a big amount of people that don't feel the sense of belonging with their with where their their surroundings. As you get older, I mean, this is my takeaway. As you get older and as you have more different experiences, you have more to pull from, and you it's almost like you see more colors, right? So. I feel like growing up, I would see things in binaries and then you're like, oh, actually, oh, that's a new version of this or a new variation of that that I had never considered before. And um, and that's cool. I guess, I don't know, this, this is a, maybe a little bit of a motivational message here, but it's just kind of like if, if something doesn't feel like it's clicking, you actually stand to gain so much by risking it and going for something different. You have absolutely no idea what that's going to reveal to you about yourself or about the world, right? And even even you saying that as you've been away from the US, you've you found more things to like about American culture. Yeah. Um it's a great example of even if you might quite enjoy the environment you're in to step out of it for a bit you can come back to it enjoying it a lot more yeah so uh when you haven't seen other walks of life even in a place where you do actually enjoy yourself you t you you stand to gain a better perspective of where you are and what makes your place good by spending some time outside of it what what i mean and this is maybe the thing i'm still trying to figure out now is like i said earlier where it's like my perspective is perhaps an individualistic perspective mm -hmm. and it's come from who I am and my upbringing and that that might not be the only perspective you can have on it. Mm -hmm. What I'm trying to learn is what the other perspectives are. It's like the conflict that I might have in a situation and the things that I'm, uh, that I'm trying to seek out or trying to understand are not necessarily the things that other people focus on. And other people will have maybe a very different perspective and will have different issues 
in ways that that are just substantially different from how I think about things. Mm. So it's it's great to explore and perhaps why we connect is because we have more of the same issues in common or we're focused mm. on more of the similar things. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I don't have a clear answer to any of this, but I will say that it's incredible to me the the adaptability of human beings and and that despite all of our differences, I mean, look, you, you grew up in two different cultures, okay? That, and I grew up in, let's say, two different cultures. No overlap there, huh. except for the fifth country that we're in, that right. we find ourselves, and we're able to have this conversation. And actually, there's so many parallels, I think, and so many shared interests and whatnot. So being human is being human. Amen. There you go. <laughs> we got it. Cut. <laughs>